I'd say the TMNT brand is doing as well now as it ever has. Multiple major video games lined up, a new movie that was a smash hit, a brand new TV series on the way, and hey look, they're in Fortnite! But since they've debuted in the inky black and white world of 80s indie comics, they've certainly had high highs and incredibly low lows. Let's take a look at the lowest they got and keep the TMNT brand humble. That's right, we're digging into Next Mutation, an embarrassment to turtle fans everywhere and a permanent mark on the face of an otherwise great franchise. This show is often used as a punching bag by those who even remember it, but I've never seen it myself until now. Join me on this journey as we inject 26 episodes of mutagen-infused cringe directly into our wrinkly rubber muscles. Hey, let's just take a quick intermission. Do you like Spider-Man? Do you like video games? Well, on March 1st, I'm going to be hosting a live autograph signing stream exclusively on my channel with the cast of Marvel Spider-Man 2. Najee Jeter, Stephen O. Young, Jim Peary, my boy Yuri Lowenthal, and even the great Tony Todd will all be there. If you go to my link in the description, you can purchase an autograph from one, two, or all of them to sign during the event and then mail straight to your door after it's over. You can personalize the autographs or have them made out to a friend or family member as a gift. During the signing, I'll be interviewing the cast of the game, so post some of your burning questions you'd like to ask each of them here in the comments, and I'll take a couple of good ones into account and ask them during the stream. Don't forget, it's on March 1st, and you won't want to miss this. Pre-sales are in the link in the description. Buying any of the autographs is a great way to support the cast and me if you want to do that, if you think I'm cool, if you like me. So don't miss out! After the popularity of the live-action films receded with each installment of the original trilogy, as did the quality of the movies themselves, the TMNT franchise needed another hit to breathe new life into it. The cartoon was a smash-hit, billion-dollar crazy success like no other, so why not attempt another foray into the world of television? The resulting series is a sort of pseudo-continuation of the movies set a little bit later when the Turtles are about to turn 18. Shredder, who is still alive somehow, <laughs> Oops! Mentions slicing off Splinter's ear and has the same scar on his face. Plus, there's no connection at all to the robot ninjas or interdimensional brain aliens or the animated series, so I think they were hoping this would come off as the next chapter for the live action turtles. TMNT 2007 has its problems, but I take that as the part 4 any day over this. When my editor, Ben, suggested we finally do this review, I realized that I didn't know anything about this show except for the basics. Being that it's not very good, Venus is a thing, and Power Rangers crossover. But in all my years as a Turtle fan, I've never heard anyone sit down and genuinely talk in detail about the content of this series. Like the characters and the storylines and the production aspects of it. So I want to take a genuine look at what's under Next Mutation Shell as a fan of the series and talk about it seriously as if it was just another one of the movies or something. Uh, you know, as seriously as I'm capable. TMNT Next Mutation is about the Turtles when they're slightly older. 17, about to be 18 years old, oh god. When they're facing new threats after their more traditional foes have already been beaten when they were younger. During the five-part opening arc of the series, they meet a fifth mutated turtle who was washed away from them during their origin story and conveniently also was found by a kindly old martial artist in Chinatown. When you were exposed to the ooze and then floated downstream into Chinatown, where you were lucky enough to be found by Chung Yi. Oh, Chung Yi. Chung Yi. She showcases her value as a member of the team by basically one-shotting the Shredder once and for all in the second episode. With him finally out of the way, Shredder is replaced by a new villain, Dragon Lord, who is basically the same as Shredder, but he's a lizard. For being in such a hurry to introduce new villains, they sure do adhere to the exact archetypes of the old ones. Spiky Murder Man, Sniveling Scientist Guy, Tiny Little Freak Man with a funny voice that's the main bad guy's comedic foil. Dragon Lord and his evil minions want to find and eat the turtles to gain some kind of mutant magic combination power-up to rule the world. This did not need to be a five-part storyline to convey all this information. Like, this is a lot of setup for essentially just, well, here's damn near the same villain that we usually fight, but this time there's a girl here too. Five parts, why? The first thing that sticks out to me is the waste of the premise that the turtles are a little bit older and doing new stuff now. Because for the most part, they don't really act or do anything differently than they did when they were 15. I know it's not that big of an age gap, they're not 30, but like, you could have done something. 
The only new development is that Mikey runs a pirate radio station out of his car, where he tells kids to stay off drugs, but also fight the establishment. Oddly enough, I don't feel like any of these voices for the turtles are bad. It's just that they're all miscast for the specific turtle they're playing. Raph's voice would be a better fit for Mikey. So, like, you're mad at me, right? No. Yo, dudes, what's the hap? Mikey's voice would be a better fit for Donatello. 3,000 horsepower, pure turbocharged, fuel-injected madness. Donatello's voice would be a better fit for Leonardo. Yo, Warrior Raph, I say it's green time. Let's save Dr. Queeze together. Leonardo's voice would be a better fit for Raphael. I can't concentrate if you're gonna keep blabbing and blowing stuff up! How'd they screw that up four times in a row? Because she grew up in China, Venus has a thick Chinese accent. I wonder if that's something the voice actress herself had. Nope, that's a white Canadian woman. Ah, I didn't give Kevin Clash a hard time. I'll give her a pass, but it's still kind of funny. Sound effects, sound effects, sound effects! They never let up on their sound effects. While the original 1990 movie did a really solid job of selling the illusion of the mutated humanoid animals with practical effects, this gives you the feeling that you're watching Barney the Dinosaur. The puppeteering and animatronics are... Uh, even for a TV budget. Jim Henson's workshop, this is not. Characters' heads look like dead-eyed, slack-jawed rubber helmets with flapping mandibles that never resemble the phonemes of their speech. Sometimes they go completely cross-eyed. Even the characters that are clearly hand puppets don't have proper lip sync. I almost wonder if the dialogue was often changed after the fact from what they recorded on set, because it's so far off. Did your mother ever tell you not to play with sharp objects? I could expect some dubbing problems from Power Rangers because that was filmed in a different language with a different storyline and they just reused footage in a completely different context, but this was made in English. Venus has the most obvious case of eye holes under her bandana I've ever seen. Well, that was until I saw this shot of Raph on the bike. I get it's a safety thing, but I simply would not have used that shot. Silver's mouth is really stiff, and the makeup on the mad scientist Dr. Queeze is a little hard on the eyes. You can always see where the makeup ends and his real skin begins on his neck, and it kills the illusion that he's this crazy old guy. You can't fool me, that's a young handsome guy under there. The most impressive visual effect in the show is that they somehow chroma keyed all five turtles in that one shot in the intro. What color were they standing against to achieve that? That's legitimately impressive to me as another hack that's always using green screen effects in my own cheap ass show. Okay, all that being said about the costumes, I still think all the costume performers are putting in the work to make the characters look really lively. Everyone moves with so much energy and has such expressive body language. I'd say the best performance in the whole show has to be Scott McNeil, who you may know as the voice of Wolverine, Piccolo, and half the cast of Beast Wars. He plays a low-rent, scraggly, Craven the Hunter type guy named Bone Steel, and he's a definite standout. His voice is so insane sounding and he's so animated and wacky, like Jim Carrey Grinch vibes from this character. I could watch this guy for hours. He's pretty much the saving grace of the whole show. Sharp tooth, long dead, but oh so useful. And that's what I love about critters. <laughs> I know the chances of this are probably really low, but do any of you in the audience know how I can contact Scott McNeil? Maybe a business email or some social media or a website to send inquiries? He's one of my all-time favorite voice actors and I'd love to work with him in a video like I did with Yuri Lowenthal, Gary Chalk, and Cal Dodd. Just putting it out there in case. I also like the Yeti crime boss named Silver and how he and his crew have this colorful Dick Tracy aesthetic. He's even voiced by Gary Chalk. Hit it, Prime! Subscribe to Xavier for more videos like this one. Though I do wish Silver was a villain in one of the animated shows instead, because his concept and design are great, but the mask is really expressionless. Imagine him in the art style of the 80s cartoon, or even Rise of the TMNT. And if we're comparing it to the cartoons, I find it really weird how we went from one of the most recognizable intro theme songs of all time to this bad, indistinct aerobics dance mix trash.
For most Turtles themes, the lyrics are always about emphasizing the uniqueness of their personalities. The 2003 one was about their moral code as ninjas and their unity as brothers. What does this song say about them? Ninjas. They're fantastic and never panic. Something about fighting until the morning? I guess it says they're brave and dedicated? Even though most episodes start with them trying to avoid helping people or dealing with conflict of any kind if it doesn't directly impact them. For having 26 episodes, you'd think this series could have had more villains, but it's just the five main ones. Dragon Lord and his goons, the evil scientist Dr. Queeze working with them, uh, Big Monkey Crime Man, Scott McNeil showing us how it's done, and this hot thousand-year-old vampire lady that shows up in the last major arc of the show. She's also got her two sidekicks, Jubilee the Explorer and Avatar Aang after hitting puberty. Turtles come in bales, not packs. Get <laughs> down from there! Because the turtles are often fighting the same villains in the same handful of locations and set pieces, these episodes start to blend together and don't leave much of an impression. The one that stuck out to me as having some potential was that they actually found the Shredder again after Venus blew his mind. He's like a half-crazed homeless man that has no clan anymore because the Foot lost their loyalty for him. Splinter takes pity on him and brings him home with the intention to nurse him back to health, and they get to explore that weird, complicated relationship a little bit. But it ends on a teaser for more storylines that never came to pass, where Shredder regains his full awareness and powers and laughs maniacally into the night. First this, then Batman vs. TMNT? This guy needs to stop trying to do sequel bait. Please don't fail, please don't fail, please don't fail. I also feel like they didn't get the memo about Raphael's personality, because he doesn't really have any angst or anger. He's only sarcastic sometimes. He's just, like, a second Mikey that's really bad at following directions and is obsessed with his motorcycle. He basically makes his bike his entire personality and talks about it constantly. Any of you chumps put a scratch on my bike, you're footing the bill. Nearly every episode has a scene of him getting told to not go outside for the night, but he blows them off and then rides his bike around the city all night shouting like a dumb hick and then crashing it into the episode's main plot. It keeps happening over and over, often with reused footage. At least they managed to keep his sibling rivalry with Leo, even to the point that there's an entire episode dedicated to it. The title of that episode is Like Brothers, even though they're not brothers. Which is it? Commit to something! Jeez! Oh Jesus, this show actually has two clip show episodes. And the second one is the series finale? Oof. I'm surprised they even had enough clips to show. Sometimes this show can go multiple episodes without a single identifiable human being, and all the action is just suit and puppet characters. A series like this one almost always has a normal human sidekick character to just be like a relatable, regular person for the audience to latch onto. Okay, Beast Wars made a great case that you don't need that character archetype if the fantastical creatures are written with enough personality and pathos. But this show makes the case that they can be really needed to flesh out a flatly written cast of characters. Having no April or Casey or any regular humans at all for them to hang out with just makes the show feel bizarre and disconnected from reality. Sometimes you need a break from every single character being an anthro puppet monster in a cave. It's like a violent fraggle rock. Except not cool, because that sounds really cool. The best human character is Splinter's friend Andre. He's a blind old man that he plays chess with in the park, who doesn't know Splinter's a mutant because he's only heard his voice. Though he's only in two episodes total, I liked him a lot and- Hey, wait a minute! I know why I like this character! He's ripped off wholesale from Hudson's buddy Jeffrey Robbins and Gargoyles. It's the exact same character and dynamic! Come on! Alright, let's talk about the light blue bandana wearing elephant in the room. Venus de Milo seems like an innocuous addition to the team at first glance, but would you believe that her entire existence actually drove a wedge between the TMNT co-creators Eastman and Laird for a good long time? Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird were co-workers who became friends, then creative partners working on the original black and white TMNT comic, back in the 80s. Once the comic blew up and then the cartoon and merchandise became million dollar avenues, they both reacted to the fame and money very differently. Peter Laird was a little bit older, he'd already settled down and had a family, and he was more financially responsible. While Kevin Eastman was younger, excited to get out there and find his next big thing after the Turtles, and he bought a tank, that's real, look it up, 
but they both initially had an agreement on one steadfast rule. No matter what, do not add a fifth Ninja Turtle. There had been this suggestion from fans, why don't you add a fifth turtle? But we both always expressed the opinion that we thought it was a stupid idea. Female or otherwise. Because once you do that, the floodgates are open. It stops being a story about the bond of four brothers, and then they become more like Transformers, where there's a core cast that's always there, and then an ever-expanding, infinite, rotating cast of new turtle-themed characters with different gimmicks being shoved in. Once you have five, why not six or seven? Or fifteen? And then it just loses the very basic appeal of these four tightly-knit, well-rounded characters. But after so many years of the Turtles' success had passed, and both of them were in a very different place in their lives, Kevin Eastman didn't feel as strongly about this rule. Nor did he feel as strongly about the franchise as a whole at the time. When the creators of the show pitched to him the idea of a female Ninja Turtle getting added, he signed off on it without Laird's consent because he just didn't think it was that big of a deal. And historically, it wasn't. But Venus de Milo became sort of a symbol of how these two guys had drifted apart over the years. They started talking less, they weren't working as closely together as they used to, and they had different opinions on the future of the brand. And Peter Laird hated this character, like so much you couldn't even joke about it to him. He was sore about it for many years. To kind of finalize their breakup, Eastman sold his shares of the ownership of TMNT to Laird so he could detach himself from Turtles and go strike out on his own to start his own comics company. Laird still had a lot of passion and love for the Turtles, and it led him to being heavily in control during the production of the 2003 TMNT series, which ended up being almost a one-to-one -one adaptation of the 80s comic with some extra stuff thrown in to keep it interesting. So ultimately, the Turtles franchise wouldn't take too much of a hit because of all this Venus stuff, and it did lead to better things, but it's a shame that Venus as a concept was apparently a big point of contention between two guys who were both really talented and worked so well together in the past. And for having such big waves on the TMNT brand, people don't remember much about her or this show. So what's the deal with her exactly? How does she fit into this team from a story standpoint? Well, not well. You're a full-fledged mutant hottie. I think I'm in love. You spare me, and I'll lead you to her. She's quite a trophy. How do I do? <laughs> <laughs> a girl turtle. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We could make a fortune renting Venus out. I don't have my trunk, so you have to promise not to peek. Unless, of course, you can. Help yourself. Oh, God, was this a Dan Harmon production? Nah, he wouldn't even add the retcon. So I am not your sister? No. Uh, you and I are just mutant boy and mutant girl. <laughs> no relation. I feel like anyone who would seriously sit down and write this dialogue making all four of the turtles completely unrelated to each other just for the sake of a potential love triangle and romance so it's not incestuous, needs to take a serious look at their life and ask what they're doing. If I could think of one of the main themes of Ninja Turtles above all else, it's brotherhood. Brothers in arms, brothers biologically, brothers in the way they act towards each other, raised together in a family like brothers, it's so baked in. It's like the most important thing maybe? And stripping that away so Leo can awkwardly try to f*** a female Ninja Turtle in this series aimed at five-year-olds is just like the most insane and horrible thing ever? What the f*** is it with Leonardo and this borderline incest shit? That's twice now! How much of a gooner brain do you have to be to make a shapely, quote-unquote, sexy Ninja Turtle with mammalian breasts sculpted into her shell? I hate this retcon because it makes everything so weird and... It all has this uncomfortable sexual tension now. Why is Leo sitting like that while Donnie polishes his sword for him? Ugh, I hate it! I'll share my chi pool with you. You can do whatever you want in your Wattpad fanfiction, but like, keep it out of the official product. That goes to you Batgirl and Batman shippers too, you knuckleheads. So if we were to take this seriously, how do you actually add a fifth Ninja Turtle? Well, they need to have a distinct personality that can mingle well with the others. All four of the original guys look the same, do kind of the same thing, but they sure don't act the same. They all have very distinct personalities to distinguish them. But Venus's personality is that she's kind of stoic and takes her training seriously. She's just a secondary Leo a lot of the time. Now, she doesn't have a specific weapon that can be associated with her, 
so she is more connected to the spiritual and mystical side of martial arts. But Splinter usually fills that role with his meditation and astral projecting and talking about mystical stuff. I really can't think of anything she actually contributes to the group dynamic that isn't already done successfully by another character. Uh, her biggest addition to the comedy is that she doesn't have a perfect grasp of the English language, and the guys have to keep correcting her. <gasps> Goal! Oh, that's hockey, Venus! There's one episode where she and Donatello kind of have this rivalry because he's all about logic and science and she's more about vibes and magic. That was kind of something, but it only happens in one episode. It really sucks that she doesn't have a weapon because instead her gimmick is that she has poorly defined magic powers that can be used in any scenario. She can do anything. And I don't mean that in a she's got a convenient aptitude for flying spaceships way. I mean she can literally warp reality and do anything with her magic. She can shoot lightning from her hands. She can track people's aura. She can see into the past. She can teleport a whole group of people. She can read and destroy your mind. She can sense where a lost candy bar is under the couch cushion from across the room. You'd think having a kind of no limits mystical Doctor Strange character would make the fight scenes more interesting, but she's mostly fighting hand to hand and like everyone else, it's pretty clunky. Even if they emote well with their bodies in the dialogue scenes, oftentimes compensating for the stiff masks, the actors in the costumes don't seem comfortable fighting in these suits. There's this sense that they can't see what they're doing, the costume is too heavy, and the choreography is kind of an afterthought. They barely use their weapons for obvious reasons, but most of the time it's like light Looney Tunes type stuff while they just shout related puns out loud. Uh, you look tired. Uh, maybe you ought to just sit this one up. Here you go. The editing is really quick, and this show can give Ed, Ed, and Eddie a run for its money with the sound effects. But all of that fails to actually give it any kind of energy and impact. It seems like the sound effects are a crutch for how slow and wonky they are. We went from Hong Kong action cinema style fights to the turtles looking clumsy, heavy, and like they don't have much training. I mean, the costumes were just as bad for the actors to wear in the actual movie itself, but they were able to work around it. The next mutation turtles look like they're about to fall on their back and get stuck. That is, until the Power Rangers crossover. It's well documented that this show's turtles teamed up with the Power Rangers, but no one told me it was actually awesome. This episode has an actual plot with stakes and drama, and the fight scenes have real choreography. In this one, the turtles move like they're actually skilled fighters with superhuman abilities. They're jumping like 10 feet in the air, doing actual coordinated moves with each other and with the Power Rangers and they look like they can see what they're doing. You could tell Power Rangers had a better fight coordinator or a better stunt team or something. Definitely more money to drop on the fight scenes because this is the best the next Mutation Turtles ever looked. Plus the sets are a little bit more expensive, the lighting is more pleasant to look at, and the photography makes the suits look a little bit more flattering. If Next Mutation was this level of quality 100% of the time, it probably wouldn't have been looked down on so hard by history. You could really tell that Power Rangers was in its prime around this time and had some budget to show off, at least relative for a live action TV show for kids. So while it's sad that the only time the Next Mutation Turtles actually looked cool was in someone else's show, they got to be exciting at least once. I wouldn't recommend most or or any of Next Mutation because of how low effort and low quality it is, but I'd at least recommend this one episode. And maybe someone out there could just make like a compilation of scenes of Bone Steel because those are worth watching. Next Mutation isn't a memorable or interesting show. It's full of episodes where it's kind of hard to remember what happens in them. The characters aren't developed in any meaningful way and the action is severely lacking. It was one of the major factors in causing a divide between the TMNT's co-creators and it can generally be seen as an embarrassing mark on an otherwise spotless brand. Well, coming out of their shells tour isn't that great either. While this series represents a sort of dark period of growing pains for the juggernaut of a franchise, none of its negative contributions were permanent thankfully. One day, decades later, Eastman and Laird would reconnect and begin working together again on stories like The Last Ronin, which, I mean, everyone talks about that. 
and Kevin Eastman would come back to write the now massively successful IDW Ninja Turtles comic that's nearing its 150th issue conclusion storyline. And the concept of a female fifth Ninja Turtle would be used more successfully on a character named Jenica in those very same comics, leading the way for Venus de Milo to make a return in a form where she's actually kind of cool and interesting instead of horribly, horribly embarrassing. I guess the main takeaway from Next Mutation is that everything has its highs and lows. While this was the first major low point for the TMNT, uh, and, you know, the third movie, they persevered and got to some major highs after this one that made us forget they even struggled at all. Even when God turns you into a horrible, clumsy, uncoordinated mutant with rubbery skin and locked jaw, there's still a chance that you can hang out with the Power Rangers and look badass for 22 minutes, and then one day be in a funny pickle commercial. I hope that inspires you somehow. I always get mad at YouTube for not putting my videos in the subscription box because people will comment, Finally, Xavier uploads again after all these years! Not knowing three other videos came out within the last month already. So, maybe that stupid bell icon thing will help you remember I exist? If you want other ways to support the channel, you can always go hit up that Patreon for early videos and exclusive stuff because it's just a dollar. I'm not kidding, it's only one dollar. Isn't that cool? If just 5% of the people subscribed to me donated only one dollar a month, I could make videos even faster and keep my house. You can also check out our merch on TeePublic, or just buy some of my random stuff on eBay. I have a pretty substantial collection of old toys that are still in the box in perfect condition, so go take a look in case you find something you like. And lastly, since this is a YouTube video and you probably play Fortnite, drop my creator code XAVIERGM next time you buy a silly dance or a cool character skin. It really helps me out. Uh, see you next time! <laughs>